Linus Torvalds returns to Linux after a one-month break and a new code of conduct. Will things change? Snap packages are a massive success on Linux. A new infographic released from Canonical explains why. The Ubuntu User Statistics webpage publishes data collected from the users that opted to share that information during Ubuntu installs. Since joining the OIN, many are left wondering what's the deal with Microsoft's open source friendly patents. I love Arch Linux, and I'm not alone, but Arch wasn't always as popular as it is now. Why is that? These are five topics that I will be taking into account. And the first story on the docket tonight is the return of Linus Torvalds after his self-imposed break. You know, Linus stepped away from Linux kernel development for the last month or so. He uh, he wanted to take time to reevaluate some of his past behavior and, you know, basically take a break from, from the project. So this article here from The Verge, this article written by Nick Stat, and as always, I will, of course, link to all the articles discussed on today's show uh, Linus Torvalds returns to Linux development with the new code of conduct in place. So, uh, this, I'm not going to spend too much time on this story, even though it's an important story and, of course, leads the news this evening. Uh, I've discussed the Linus taking a break and the code of conduct uh, a couple of times on the channel, and at, every time it's been brought up, we end up with a lot of infighting and a lot of conflict you know it really was a a code of conflict in many ways but anyway linus he stepped away about a month ago he decided to step away from kernel development for for a little while he actually didn't give us any kind of hint exactly how long he would be gone and when he would be back but he just wanted to take some time uh, a quote from him was i need to change some of my behavior i want to apologize to the people that my personal behavior hurt and possibly drove away from kernel development so again this was a quote from him when he left you know he admitted that his behavior probably did create some division amongst the kernel team and that he did drive people away from kernel development because of his kind of harsh uh, attitudes sometimes Anyway, he took his time off. Now he's back. He's in charge of the kernel tree again. So uh, for the last month, of course, his second in command, if you will, interim Linux chief was uh, Greg Croa Hartman, who, you know, Torvalds appointed to oversee the development of the kernel. So it's kind of like Linus's right hit right hand man, Greg Crowe Hartman does a fantastic job if and when Linus decides to leave the Linux kernel development you know, permanently retire or move on to something else, it would be Greg Crow or Hartman that would probably take over the reins from Linus Torvalds. So the the colonel was in good hands while he was gone. Now it's back in good hands, of course, with, with Linus being back. Anyway, Linus uh, had this to say about his time off. These past few months have been a tough one for our community, as it is our community that is fighting from within itself with prodding from others outside of it. Actually, that quote was from Greg Crower Hartman. So what Greg Crower Hartman's saying here, these past few months have been tough, uh, and a lot of it is because of people prodding the community, the community, the Linux community from outside of that community. So he's talking about people that are really not part of kernel development that really stoked the flames of a lot of this conflict with the code of conduct that was implemented. So when Linus left about a month ago, along with the announcement that he was leaving, you know, taking a, a, a temporary break from kernel development, it was also announced that the Linux kernel was, of course, introducing a new code of conduct that was based on the Contributor Covenant, which was created by Caroline Ada Emke. Emke is a very controversial figure. Because of that, a lot of people had a problem with the Linux kernel adopting the new code of conduct. A lot of them thought that maybe the code of conduct was being forced on Linus Torvalds in particular and the kernel team um, that was not the case Linus of course ultimately he's the one that makes all the decisions with the kernel and the kernel team so uh, nobody forced Linus's hands with this code of conduct he was completely behind the code of conduct and after a month you know of being implemented you know there we haven't seen uh, any real blowback from it the the kernel team is still going strong. Nobody has left the project over the code of conduct, despite what you see in some of the flame wars between people who do not develop the Linux kernel. 
you see a lot of um, infighting on Twitter and Reddit and social media in general. But as far as like the kernel mailing list and stuff, you really don't see these guys worrying about the code of conduct. They're OK with it. Uh, you did have some trolls that were trolling the Linux kernel mailing list, but they weren't actual kernel developers. They were just, again, trolls that were trolling the mailing list. But all in all, you know, everything is right with the world and everything is right with the kernel. So Torvalds is back. The code of conduct is in place. Everybody seems to be OK with it, at least the people involved with the kernel de development. Uh, Greg Crower Hartman, he mentions that. We all need to remember that every year new people enter our community with the goal or requirement to get stuff stuff done for their job, their hobby, or just because they want to help contribute to the tool that has taken over the world and it enabled everyone to have a solid operating system base on which to build their dream. So every year, you know, hundreds, thousands, new people come to Linux kernel development, you know, because the corporation they work for require them to work on the kernel, you know, for their job or because it's a fun hobby for them. They, you know, want, they're interested in how kernel development, is, you know, operates or whatever, and they just want to contribute something to it. And not a lot, some of these people that come to this have really not that much experience. And what Crow Hartman here basically says, we don't want to drive away people, you know, just because some of us, you know, he's talking about himself and Linus and a lot of the, um, People that are mainstays on the kernel development team have, you know, just thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of kernel development under their belt, where these new people, of course, are complete noobs and they don't want to be driving away some of these people before they ever really get started. And, you know, um, that was part of the problem with Linus's behavior, which Linus admits that, you know, sometimes he was harsh to some of these people. They contributed to bad code which bad code, of course, can't make it in the kernel, but the way he reacted to it was not positive, at least long term for the kernel, because you end up driving people away before they ever really uh, learn what they're doing and r before they ever really see their full potential of, you know, contributing to the kernel. Just reading the last paragraph from the uh, the Verge article here. It's not clear whether the state of Linux development will suddenly become more accepting and positive, especially considering Torvalds was only gone for about one month. But with the new code of conduct in place and Torvalds' pledge to examine his own actions and prove his behavior, it sounds like productive first steps are being made to revise the Linux community's culture for the better. Uh, I couldn't agree more with that, I think. All, all in all, this has been uh, pretty positive. Even the fighting that went on, I think a lot of it was healthy. I think it was a healthy discussion. There were some that, that took it to extremes. <laughs> but all in all, uh, uh, this has, I think, been a positive for Linux. All right, and the second story on the docket tonight, Snap Packages. They are a massive success. Why? Well, there's a new infographic that has been put out on the internet from Canonical that explains why. So, uh, this article from Beta News from Brian Fagioli. Uh, one of the big knocks against Linux-based operating systems is lack of software. The truth is there are countless excellent programs for both product productivity and fun. One fair criticism, however, is fragmentation between distributions. So where he's going with this is we have too many distributions out there. Every distribution pretty much has their own package management. There's too many package formats. You know, we have dibs and RPMs and snaps and flat packs and app images and, you know, a million other things. Uh, you know, uh, tarballs and Gentoo packages and slack builds. And uh, ultimately, though, wouldn't it be nice if we had package formats that worked on all distros that were distro agnostic and worked across all platforms you know, on, on Linux, that is all Linux platforms. And we do have actually more than one package format that's like that. Now we have snaps, we have Flatpak, and we have app images. These are distro agnostic Linux package formats that allow a lot more software availability now on Linux, especially third party software like third-party proprietary closed source software things that you won't find say in the ubuntu repos which only has free and open source software you know so think 
closed source software like Skype, Spotify, Discord, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, that's not going to be in the Ubuntu repo, but if those third party companies want to package that as a snap pack and make it available, that's okay. So snap packs have really brought a lot of uh, good software to, of course, both Ubuntu, but pretty much every distro out there because any distro can use snap packs. So things like Opera are available as a snap pack. Uh, the Microsoft PowerShell is available as a snap pack. Firefox now is available as a snap pack. I'm not sure why you would install it as a snap. I'm sure there are use cases for it, but Firefox, of course, is going to be in the repos anyway. Skype, uh, I mentioned, is a snap. So is Slack. So is Spotify, uh, Plex. Um, anyway, Canonical put out this rather lengthy infographic. So anyway, just quickly, uh, snaps and numbers. This was published, of course, October 2018 from Snapcraft, which is like the... Uh, the, the snap pack website anyway there's over 4100 snaps now available for download that is impressive over 4000 snap packages exist exist so this is 4000 packages that are potentially available for install on your linux distro whatever linux distro you happen to have that may or may not be in the standard repos for your distro that is a massive increase in software availability on linux so certainly a positive. Over 100,000 snap installs per day to the cloud server, container, desktop, and Internet of Thing devices. So uh, these things are being installed at a rate of over 100,000 per day. More than 3 million new snap installs a month. And there's an asterisk there. I'm not sure. Maybe it's going to qualify that in some way. I'm not exactly sure. Anyway, it's supported across 41 Linux distributions. Uh yeah, it should work on pretty much any Linux distribution, snap packs, but they mention specifically snaps are available, on, but probably available by default, maybe. I, I don't know. But they mention Ubuntu, Debian, Linux Mint, Arch Linux, uh, Kubuntu, Fedora, Ubuntu Mate, and Raspbian. Snaps are used in every major country worldwide, so, of course, Ubuntu itself is used in pretty much every major country worldwide. Ubuntu proper, you know, the mainline Ubuntu uh, Linux uh, distro. Insanely popular, probably hundreds of millions of installs around the world. And uh, many of those machines, of course, are going to be using snaps. Many of them, especially the recent versions of Ubuntu, uh, the desktop editions anyway, have snaps installed by default already. Uh, a lot of people use snaps on the servers. A great way, I've mentioned a couple of times on the channel before, a great way to install Nextcloud, for example, on a server sudo snap install nextcloud it installs nextcloud and all of all of its dependencies in this snap container so the apache server for example gets installed alongside nextcloud it's already configured for you just sudo snap install nextcloud you're good so one of the benefits to, to snaps is that it installs all the dependencies for that particular program so you don't have to worry you don't ever get into one of these uh, situations like building something from source where you get into dependency hill where you have dependencies that you're not you, you can't find in the repos. You might have to go out and try to find them and build the dependencies from source. And then you go down this rabbit hole of you're constantly building things from source just to get that one program you wanted. Anyway, why snaps? Uh, it's quick to install. There's automatic updates for snaps and they are safe to run. So they're touting uh, that the snaps are safe. I would say snaps are safe at, or absolutely as safe as Flatpak, app images, PPAs, the AUR. Uh, now, there are security issues with pretty much any package format, but snaps are not inherently any more safe or any less safe than any other package format. Uh, popular snaps include, we've already mentioned Spotify, Plex, uh, VLC, I guess, has a snap. Uh, some server stuff, AWS and, and the Azure <laughs> is available as a snap. Anyway, really neat infographic. I will link to the article, which also will include the infographic in the show description. All right, and the third story on the docket tonight is recently Ubuntu set up a new user statistics web page on the Ubuntu.com website. This is where they publish all the data collected from those that opted in to the telemetry uh, on the new Ubuntu installs. You, you guys know in Ubuntu 8, 18.04 and of course with the re recent release of 18.10. 
you know, users have the option of opting in to sharing data about your machine with Canonical. Nothing personal. They're not scanning your um, file system. Um, they don't track IPs. It's no personal data of any kind. They want to know, you know, what kind of CPU you have, what kind of GPU you have, what's your screen resolution for your monitor. Uh, are you installing this on physical hardware or are you installing this in a virtual machine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the only somewhat personal information uh, they track, they do know what time zone you re you're in, but time zone is so such a vast swath <laughs> of the planet. Uh, they really have no idea exactly where you're at. For example, they know I'm in the central time zone in the U.S. Beyond that, they have no idea where I'm at. So anyway, but the point is Ubuntu, you opt in into, the, into, into this. You can opt out. Uh, you don't have to, to share this information with them. The other thing is they actually publish all the information that they are gathering from users. Unlike a company like Microsoft with Windows 10, we really don't know what Microsoft is tracking with their telemetry. They won't tell you. Uh, so, but anyway, back to the Ubuntu user statistics webpage here. So this report is generated from basic non-identifiable system data that was provided by users when installing Ubuntu 18.04 LTS. So this is the stats from 18.04. Probably don't have a lot of stats yet from 18.10 because it was just released. Plus 18.10 is not going to be nearly as popular as far as downloads as 18.04. 18.04 was a L LTS release for Ubuntu. Many, 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 many more people run the LTS releases of Ubuntu than these interim releases like 18.10. Um, Anyway, uh, let's uh, see what was reported. So user report, how many users opted in? 66% of people opted in. So two out of every three users opted in to share that data. When I do my Ubuntu installs, whether on physical hardware or in a VM, I always opt in. I don't mind sharing non-personal information with Canonical and the Ubuntu guys, the, the Ubuntu devs. Uh, if it helps them make a better project uh, product, because ultimately, if Ubuntu is able to, you know, help us get better driver support and whatnot, hardware support, um, it benefits not just Ubuntu, but it, it benefits the entire Linux ecosystem. So I have no problem opting in. I apparently 66 percent of you have no problem opting into that as well. Real or virtual machines, so. Some machines could not be determined as either real or virtual, so that data is not included in this report. That is interesting that the telemetry, I guess there, there's a lot of installs, it can't tell whether they're real or virtual. I'm not sure why that is, but physical machines, you see the orange, looks like a little less than half. The virtual machine installs though, well, it's a little less than a quarter, but then you have, you know, a little more than a quarter in this gray area here that we're not sure what those installs are, but a lot of people install Ubuntu in VMs. All right, clean install or upgrade. 80% do clean installs. That's usually what I do. Upgrades were 20%. Uh, even though like from the LTS to the next LTS, you can upgrade. I think what most people do after two years, it's probably time to go ahead and back up and do a clean install anyway. Because after two years or even after four years, if you go like 1604 to 2004, you know, that, uh, that's a lot of cruft that gets accumulated on your system after so many years. So clean installs are usually the way to go if you can, if you got good backups. Uh, but even if you upgrade, you should have good backups. Sometimes the upgrades do not go as planned. So where are Ubuntu users? We have this map showing you some of the most popular places in the world uh, for Ubuntu. And I'm sure this is based on per capita. So, because, yeah, so Russia. <laughs> Ubuntu is very popular in Russia and Brazil, Australia, too, per capita. Mexico, a lot of Ubuntu users. What language do most Ubuntu users use? I guess this is for when you set your... Uh, you know, key table and language, 59% uh, English, 7% Spanish, 5% others, uh, French, 5%, Portuguese, 5%, Chinese, 4%, German, 4%. Okay. Desktop specs, uh, OS architecture, 98% of us are on 64-bit. <laughs> so this is why Ubuntu no longer supports 32-bit 
there's no need for it. So that explains that our display server, 99% of Ubuntu users use X11. I'm assuming the 1% that are not using X11 are using Wayland, <laughs> but I, I, Ubuntu 18.04 by default used X11. So it would be strange for this to not be close to 100% because why would you remove the display server that ship by default on your system? But I guess at least 1% of the people did that. Firmware, so UEFI versus BIOS, we have that here. What graphics setup do users have? 93% uh, of us use one screen. 7% I guess have multiple monitors. Uh, 94% of us have one GPU, so 6% of us have dual, or better, GPUs. That's interesting uh, that so many people have multiple GPUs using Linux because Linux is not that great for, for multiple GPUs. Um, that's usually for people wanting, you know, to, to game. <laughs> it's usually what people use, like those dual uh, NVIDIA cards or dual AMD cards for. Not that, you know, you can't get a, a decent gaming experience on Linux now. It's certainly gotten so much better than it used to be. Anyway, popular screen sizes, by far the most popular screen size, 1920 by 1080 is what most people do on the desktop. 1366 by 768 is what most people do on laptops. That's just kind of the default screen resolutions for your desktop and your laptop. That's what most people are set to. CPU and memory, yeah. Yada, yada, yada. Anyway, neat little website. I will link to it so all of you can check out the statistics. And the fourth story on the docket tonight. Since joining the OIN, the Open Invention Network, many have been left wondering what is the deal with Microsoft's open source friendly patents? Uh, are all the patents covered? I mean, what exactly... How, how does this change anything? So... To explain this a little more, ZDNet, so this article from Stephen J. Vaughn Nichols over at ZDNet, what's the deal with Microsoft's open source friendly patents? In the aftermath of Microsoft joining the OIN Linux Friendly Patent Consortium, many questions remain, and at a open source summit Europe, some of them were answered. So there was a open source summit Europe uh, convention, basically, where the OIN CEO, a guy named Keith Bergelt, answered a lot of questions regarding the recent news of, of Microsoft joining the OIN. So, why did Microsoft join the OIN? Well, the answer, according to Bergelt, is simple. Open source. Uh, it's all about open source these days. Quote A quote from Bergelt here. Keith Bergelt is CEO of OIN. Open source changed everything. Customers have changed. 15 years ago, a CIO would have said, we have no open source, and that would have been wrong, but that's what they thought. You didn't need open source, so now the game has changed. CIOs know open source is essential. Microsoft, in particular, knows open source is essential. Microsoft has always been accompanied by, of, and for developers. You know, Microsoft has been quoted in recent months and recent years being for developers, 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 it's all about developers, developers. <laughs> they're all in on trying to attract as many developers as they can. And one of the big things is open source, right? That's kind of a big deal with developers, open source software. So um, a lot of people are worried that, you know, because of Microsoft's actions in the past, they're worried about basically, they're scared that Steve Ballmer is going to come back, right? Steve Ballmer, who famously said Linux was a cancer but, you know, he's not coming back. Ballmer's gone. And this really is a new Microsoft. Satya Nadella is not Bill Gates, and he's not Steve Ballmer. Those guys, of course, were very anti-Linux, anti-open source, anti-free software. They saw that as a legitimate threat to their company, and they wanted it destroyed. They wanted it squashed. The new Microsoft is realizes open source is not going away. Uh, they just want to get in on the game, and they want to profit from, from it, quite frankly. And nothing wrong with that. I mean, we, me as a Linux user, I think most of you as Linux users have no problems with Red Hat profiting from open source, or Canonical, or SUSE, or Oracle. I mean, you can make money with free and open source software. Uh, you just have to do it the right way. And Microsoft so far seems to be going about it the right way. So they've open sourced a lot of these patents. 
Um, the OIN CEO, Keith Bergelt, was asked about the patents. Uh, he, he claims that he has been talking to Microsoft, Bergelt, he's been talking with Microsoft for nine years, and that for the last three years, they've been in, quote, productive talks with Microsoft. So this wasn't just all of a sudden they joined the OIN. Bergelt has been talking them to them in a serious way for three years, and really he says he's been in talks with them for the last nine years. So, uh, what is, you know, covered in these Microsoft patents? Was there anything kept out? And according to Bergelt, no. All of Microsoft's patents are covered by the OIN license. There are no exceptions. The license is the license. So, there you go. We, we wondered, you know, was everything covered? In particular, people have questioned, was XFAT uh, file system, XFAT, covered? It is. Everything, according to Bergelt, is covered. There are no exceptions. So if you are a member of the OIN, you can use all of Microsoft's patents. And Microsoft can use all of yours. That is how the OIN works. Now you do have to be a member. Like I can't do something with XFAT because I'm not a member of the OIN. But guess what? Red Hat can. Canonical can. <laughs> so, you know, there are I mean, there are some legal things here. Speaking of things that uh, Red Hat can do, uh, this from the Red Hat or uh, Fedora mailing list, I think. Yeah, anyway, this guy here posts something about uh, some patents, WMA, WMV. I'm not exactly sure what he's talking about, but the too long didn't read version, the TLDR, is we can enable full subpixel rendering in Fedora's free type. So now Fedora and Red Hat can enable subpixel rendering. I'll link to a Wikipedia article about subpixel rendering. It's basically just going to give you better fonts, especially on LCD and LED displays. Because those patents that covered subpixel font rendering now are covered under the OIN. They were Microsoft patents. So now Red Hat, also being a member of the OIN, can use those patents. So uh, already we're going to see some you know, progress here with, with some of these patents, you know, some of these open source uh, Linux distros using some of the Microsoft patents and they cannot be sued. Microsoft agreed to this. So it's a good thing. I, I, I'm, I'm really liking what I've, I've seen so far from Microsoft since they wanted to get into the open source game. You know, they heart Linux, they heart Git, they heart open source, and it seems to be for real. And the fifth and final story on the docket tonight. This is going to be a fun one because this is not a serious uh, bit of news at all. As a matter of fact, this is not a news article at all. Uh, I love Arch Linux, and I'm not alone. But Arch wasn't always as popular as it is now. Why is that? And I got the idea from this uh, from this particular post on Reddit. So over at Reddit on r slash Linux, why was Arch initially not as popular as it is lately, this guy? He, he pondered this question. And when I uh, just read the title of this thread without even reading the thread, I was thinking, he's absolutely right. If you've been around Linux for a number of years, Arch was not that popular early on when it first came into creation. Arch Linux has been around, I think, since the early 2000s. I want to say it's not much older than Ubuntu, maybe even the same age as Ubuntu. Initial release, March 2002. So it was released two years before Ubuntu. Ubuntu came out, of course, the first Ubuntu was 4.10, so October of 2004. But Arch, you know, it really took many, many, many years for Arch to kind of catch on to become as popular as, as it is now. Now, you know, you can't you know, go anywhere as far as you know, like a Linux conference or user group or whatever without tripping over somebody that's using Arch and wants to tell you <laughs> that they're using Arch. This was not the case years ago. If I go to distrowatch.com right now, of course, their page hit rankings. This is not, a, you know, an accurate measure of anything. It's not a real metric. But right now, the last six months, Arch is the 12th most popular distro, at least on DistroWatch. If I, you know, went back though so they came out in 2002 what was arch ranked in the page hit rankings in 2002 
Can I even find Arch? Yes, Arch was 27th. Let's skip ahead two years. Let's go to 2004. Where is Arch? Ranked 20, 22. So, creeped up just a couple of spots. 26, or 2006, excuse me. Arch is still 22. <laughs> so, we, we're going up, you know, by two years. I mean, it's still not really catching on. It's somewhere around 25 to 30 on the page hit rankings list. We go to 2008. Skip ahead two more years. If I can, did I hit the go button here? No, I didn't. Where is Arch? Now Arch is creeping up 17. That's a substantial jump. Let's go ahead to 2010, two more years. Arch is now in the top 10 in the Distro Watch page hit rankings. I won't go any further. You guys saw it's 12 this year. But from 2010 till now in 2008, it hovers around the top 10. Sometimes, I think one year it got as high as number 7 for the entire year. So Arch is a very popular Linux distro now, but again, you saw it took a number of years, like a decade, really, to get to the point where it had, you know, the, the kind of user base it has now. Why is that? Well, reading a little bit of this Reddit thread, a lot of people, you know, ponder why this is the case. The One of the most obvious reasons why Arch is the most popular, well, not most popular Linux distro, why it is one of the more popular Linux distros now, where it was kind of a obscure, not that many people used it distro early on, is because Gentoo was around. Gentoo was kind of the new hotness. Gentoo also came out around the same time. Gentoo, Arch, Ubuntu, strangely enough, all came out around, you know, the early 2000s. But Gentoo was where kind of the hardcore minimalists went to that wanted to compile everything. Plus, Gentoo had a fantastic documentation. The Gentoo wiki was great. Well, Gentoo had a major snafu around 2010, I think. They lost their wiki, uh, that you know, for whatever reason. Uh, and the Arch wiki was still around. <laughs> so Arch was really making their wiki really good. And it got to the point where, okay, Gentoo lost their wiki. Arch had this fantastic wiki, fantastic documentation. A lot of people just started using the Arch wiki. A lot of people just started using Arch. Again, you notice in the Distro Watch page hit rankings, I mentioned Gentoo lost its wiki 2010. When did uh, Arch... Uh, pop into the top 10 in the distro watch page hit rankings around 2010. So that is certainly a big reason. Another reason I think is Arch, even though it's, it's saying it's not a user-friendly distro, it really has gotten a lot more user-friendly than it was in, in its early days. My, me, myself, I have played with Arch. I've installed Arch off and on over the past, I would say seven or eight years, and even in seven or eight years, not even going way back to like 2002, but just in the last seven or eight years, I can tell you the installs have gotten a lot easier. Yes, they're command line installs, but that that web page, that wiki page for the installation guide for Arch is a, it's one page. It's very easy to read, very easy to understand. The installs, pretty straightforward, or something like a Gentoo install. It takes a lot of time, a little bit more involved, um, also Arch, I think it's been made popular because it has become such a good base to base other distros off of. I think the rise of distros like years ago, what really helped Arch was Archbang was one of the first Arch based distros. I remember coming on the scene that gained some notoriety. Chakra for a KDE distro was also an early Arch derivative that gained some popularity. And of course, in recent years, Manjaro and Antergos have just exploded in popularity. So, and now it seems like, like on the channel, I've probably reviewed 50 different Arch-based Linux distributions. So uh, there are, it seems like there's almost as many Arch-based distributions out there now as Debian-based distros, which was not the case just a few years ago. Uh, just quickly, a couple of more reasons, I think, that helped Arch Linux kind of just skyrocket up the rankings. Arch really became a, a meme in a lot of ways. Uh, really, Gentoo was kind of a meme early on. That was where all the nerds wanted to hang out. Then in the last few years, Arch is kind of where the nerds want to hang out. It's where all the cool kids want to be. Not only that, the meme where you 
run Arch and you tell everybody, hey, I'm running Arch, you know, it gets, you know, that joke has gotten a little old, but I do think that some people actually probably do run Arch just because of the meme factor. Another reason that Arch has gotten more popular over the years is artwork, in particular, their branding, their logo. Early on in Arch Linux's history, this was the Arch Linux logo. How do you like that Arch there? And the font, the font. Now, of course, they have changed to something like this. Wow, what a difference, right? And you would be surprised how many people actually install a distro based on looks, based on a logo, based on a name, based on theming. I have actually read comments on Linux distributions like support forums. Hey, I'm brand new to Linux. I picked your distro from DistroWatch because I really liked your logo. I actually read a, a post one time on the Gentoo forums. Hey, you know, I'm brand new to Linux. I'm trying to get Gentoo installed. Can you guys help me? I picked your uh, distro because I really like the Gentoo logo. <laughs> Oddly enough, you would be surprised that there are actually people out there that will, will choose a distro, you know, just based on artwork. And that is the fifth and final story on the docket tonight. So, uh, this was taking into account episode 13. So we did not have a taking into account episode last week because I release these episodes every Thursday. Last Thursday, I was out of state uh, on a business trip, so I could not record a video last week. I could have recorded it a, a, a day or two early and released it on Thursday, or I could have maybe re recorded it Friday and released it, you know, on Friday, but the problem also doing that was last week was just an insanely busy week because of all, all the Ubuntu releases. I really needed to make those recordings. Those were already kind of on the schedule. So we, we skipped a week last week. I do apologize for that, but it, it really couldn't be helped uh, ultimately though because of my my real job, unfortunately. Uh, the bills have to be paid. So uh, taking into account episode 13, as always, I usually end the show by reading a viewer question or comment, either from uh, email or a comment from YouTube or comment from Mastodon. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to read a question from Mastodon. This was a direct message to me, so it's a private message. So I'm actually not going to show it because it will include the person's name. But anyway, it was basically asking me, hey, I just found your channel kind of new to Linux. What distro are you running? What window manager, desktop environment are you running? And I'm assuming, because he's a new user, he's thinking if these things work for me, it's going to work for him. Anyway, so I tell him, you know, I'm running the uh, Manjaro's i3 edition, but I'm using the Qtile tiling window manager instead of the i3 tiling window manager. Um, of course, telling a new user that, he, I'm not sure if he really grasped that, but anyway. He mentions that, uh, yeah, so you're using Manjaro. Uh, I, I might use Manjaro because you're using Manjaro. What do you suggest? Gnome? Budgie? Also, I'm coming from Windows. Do I need antivirus for Linux? Do I need a system cleaner? Like if I need to remove a program in Linux, I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks. I uh, really appreciate the question. I did answer this guy. This question was actually about three days ago, private message on Mastodon. And I answered the guy. I'll, I'll just respond with what I answered. So, basically, uh, if you're just coming to Linux as a new user, Manjaro isn't the best choice for a distro. I know a lot of new users go to distrowatch.com. They see Manjaro is number one, way number one in the DistroWatch page hit rankings. Those numbers are meaningless. They don't mean anything. They're not real. Manjaro is not really the most popular Linux distro. It's just the most popular Linux distro on that webpage, the distrowatch.com webpage. Manjaro is a rolling release distro. So for new users, rolling release means all packages on that system are constantly being updated. That inherently is not stable. Uh, it's inherently less stable than what we call fixed release distros. Distros like Ubuntu, Fedora, SUSE, Mint. Those are really the distros where a new user wants to steer to, right? Uh, you don't need to go with a rolling release distro if you're brand new to Linux because by its very nature, rolling release distros, things are going to break. Now, it may not be major breakages. You're not going to be rebooting the machine and getting kernel panics every other week, but you will have minor things break. Uh, NVIDIA drivers, you know, uh, grub problems, you know, 
things that crop up that an experienced Linux user like me, I've seen a million times, I know how to fix. If you're brand new to Linux, you have no idea how to fix these things. So it's best to stick with a distro where these kinds of problems don't crop up because most of the programs on your system won't be updated. So stick with Ubuntu LTS, stick with the latest Linux Mint, stick to OpenSUSE Elite. Those kinds of distros are really where the new user needs to be. As far as the question about do you need antivirus in Linux, no. You don't have to worry about running antivirus in Linux. It's kind of pointless. Most antivirus programs on Linux are really just scanning for Windows viruses anyway. I've never run antivirus on any of my Linux machines. And I've been running Linux full-time for a decade now. Uh, do you need a system cleaner to remove programs from your system? No, the package manager is just fine for just installing and removing programs. And yes, you can, uh, there are system cleaners that will help you clean out things like your cache and your, your log files and stuff. Are they needed? Not really. Uh, this is completely different than Windows. Not as much cruft gets accumulated on your Linux installs as your Windows machines. So hope that answered your question. And before I go, this show was made possible by Ansem, Carlos, David, Leo, Rob, and Tony. These are the producers of the show. These are my highest tiered patrons. The show is also brought to you by the fine ladies and gentlemen, all their names on the screen. They are the supporters of this channel. If you enjoy this video, please consider supporting the channel. You will find me at DistroTube over on Patreon. Peace, guys.